In this short lecture, we're going to look at the subject of level crossings. And we're going to look at some examples in the Edinburgh area. The Highway Code is a good place to start. It gives instructions to vehicle users and other road users regarding the safe use of level crossings. It also shows details of the various signs that can be deployed at level crossings to provide instruction or warning to those about to use it or approach it. So on approach to the level crossing, these are some of the signs that you might see. The one with the tram is to indicate that trams are crossing ahead. The one with the gate is that a level crossing with barrier or gate is approaching. And the steam engine refers to a level crossing without a barrier or gate ahead. There might be lights as well. And there might be chevrons which show the uh, distance to the, uh, the crossing. There's also a risk of long or low vehicles uh, being uh, striking the crossing infrastructure as they cross. So longer vehicles have to contact the signaler before they cross. You may also have overhead line electrification, so there could be a warning sign about the height of that overhead line. And importantly, drivers of any large or slow vehicles must get permission to cross. I use a telephone to contact the signaler. So as well as the big wag lights for the cars approaching, there could be smaller lights for pedestrians and the footpaths. There will be indication of where the telephone is and there may be some smaller uh, miniature warning lights depending on the type of crossing and if the crossing doesn't have a barrier it will have this cross above the, uh, the signs with uh, warnings of having to give way to the trains. The actual track area itself has a yellow chevron box which would indicate that you're not supposed to enter that box unless your exit is clear. So it's quite a broad range of equipment that's used in level crossings and a good thing to do is look at a supplier. In this case, uh, Unipart Dorman provide a range of uh, equipment from wigwags to standing red man lights to uh, miniature stop lights uh, and a range of other indicators and lights that are located in various places at the level crossing. So it's worth a look. So have a look at the, the website here and have a look at some of the equipment that they provide. So the basic principle of a level crossing is to allow traffic or pedestrians to cross the tracks. The level of the passing road is the same as that of the railway, hence the term level crossing. If you're designing a new railway, it's generally a good idea to avoid these due to safety reasons. Modern trains are much faster and quieter than they used to be. Therefore, we need much more complex systems for warning of trains approaching. Passive crossings rely on the user of the crossing to make an informed decision as to whether or not it's safe to cross. However, some crossings have red flashing lights and automatic gates that are lowered when a train is passing. A telephone or radio connection is often provided, and that's so you can contact the signaler in case of an emergency. The only way to fully eradicate the risk associated with level crossings is to remove them completely. The document here provided by Network Rail provides lots of details about how they've been enhancing the safety of crossings and how they intend to continue this work. So like any civil engineering project, technical specification is critical. And for example, if you're going to use pandrel clips near a crossing, they should be corrosion protected to ensure that the salt and grit applied to the roads doesn't uh, cause them uh, excessive corrosion. They might have things called audible warning devices, overlay miniature stoplights, integrated miniature stoplights, and these are used to improve the awareness of approaching trains. They might have audible warnings, which might state that another train's coming. However, these, these have got environmental noise impact issues associated with local residents. We'll use uh, LED lights for our halogen lamps as well because they use less, uh, they have a lower wattage, but produce the same amount of light. The decision point is the position where the gate, the barrier or the sign is, and that's linked to the issue of uh, traverse time. The RSSB have produced uh, some documents which will look at accidents and investigate the causes of accidents and provide details of potential solutions. And you can see that a good example of that in document T984 published in 2015 as shown on the right. 
They'll undertake things like interviews, uh, observations, user evaluation of new decision points, and they'll often do what are called cognitive walkthroughs, where they consider the in the shoes of a pedestrian or in the, the, the shoes of a, a driver in a car. And the other thing they do as well is track eye movements to see where people actually look as they cross. You have to consider a broad range of people and users, for example, dog walkers with a dog on and off the lead, cyclists mounted or dismounted, horse riders, herders, wheelchair users. And uh, quite an unusual uh, consideration is a vehicle user in pedestrian mode. So that's somebody who has a vehicle license, drives a car, but is actually walking across. So you can see details of two level crossings taken from that ORR report. The one on the left shows a, a gate system. Uh, you can see there's an activity space for the gates as these ones uh, move out rather than up. And you can see that the, the warning sign for the gates has to be a set distance from the gate line. And that depends on the permissible speed of the road. On the one on the right, you can see there's a half barrier system and the barriers lift vertically. And now we've got wigwag boards uh, with red lights on them and amber lights too. And you also see that the signs, there's a number of different signs that are located on the approach to this particular crossing. You also note that there's a lay-by provision for large vehicles to stop the driver to then contact the signaller and they can wait there until they are given permission to cross. So this table summarises the different types of crossing. And we can see initially they're categorised into protected and unprotected crossings. So protected crossings will have confirmation that the crossing is clear by either a signaller, a gatekeeper, an obstacle detection system, by the driver or by one of the train crew. An unprotected crossing will have warning arrangements in place. So warning that there's an approaching train, uh, a telephone, or maybe they work on line of sight. And we can see there are acronyms used to describe these. So the first one at the top uh, being MCG, that's a manually controlled gate crossing. And if you look further down, we'll see uh, a CBOD in this table, which is sometimes referred to as an MCOB, which is a manually controlled barrier with object detection. And if you look to the right, the bottom right hand side, you'll see a UWC. And that's similar to another one we're going to look at in closer detail in the following slide. So as of 2020, Network Rail had 5,678 crossings to manage. Now you can see in this table the breakdown between passive and active crossings, where active crossings are then broken down into manual and automatic crossings. So in relation to level crossings, there's lots of equipment that has to be installed at the side of the track. And this control equipment is often housed in little housings or buildings or little structures at the side of the track. What Siemens have been doing recently is constructing these off-site in manufacturing facilities and then delivering them to site in prefabricated units. And this has saved a lot of time in terms of installation and testing on site. Clearly they still have to do the commissioning work on site, but this saves a lot of time and a lot of money and can assure greater quality. So there are two principal methods for object detection at level crossings. The first is LIDAR. So this is a method for measuring distances or ranging by illuminating the target with laser light and measuring the reflection with a sensor. Differences in laser return times and wavelengths can then be used to make a digital 3D representation of the target. And this is terrestrial, airborne and mobile applications. RADAR is a detection system that uses radio waves to determine the range, angle, and velocity of objects. It can be used to detect aircraft, ships, spacecraft, guided missiles, motor vehicles, weather formations, and terrain. The complete MCBOD level crossing includes LIDAR as the complementary obstacle detector alongside radar and CCTV equipment. While the radar is used to detect vehicles or large objects that can cause damage to a train and endanger its passengers, the LiDAR is designed to protect passers-by or cyclists who could be trapped between the barriers. The system is sensitive enough to detect a nine-year-old child lying or standing or crossing the track. The signalling tells the LiDAR when the level crossing is active and the detection system scans the crossing area within the barriers accordingly. If the crossing is clear, the signal turns green and the train can go through safely. If an object is detected, the barriers are raised to enable that object, a vehicle or pedestrian, to leave the area before allowing the train to pass. The system is fully automated, so if the object is static and the system has gone through three cycles, 
a message can be sent to the train driver to proceed with caution at no more than 5 miles per hour to determine what is obstructing the track. So we're now going to have a look at three level crossings in the Edinburgh area. Kings now, New Mills Road and Kurt Newton. And these are all on the Shots line that takes the trains to Glasgow Central. So the first crossing at Kings now is an MCB OD. So that's a manually controlled barrier monitored by obstacle detection. The next one at New Mills Road is in a rural location and is a user worked crossing and that's on a public footpath. The third one is another MCB OD and that's at Kurt Newton. So this is an aerial photograph of the King's Now MCB OD crossing. You see the main line approaching and you can see the angle that the road crosses the tracks. So this is an extract from my old quail map and you can see Slateford Station and the junction there, the Water of Leith Viaduct and then King's Now Station. And in this old quail map it shows an automatic half barrier and that's now been replaced and replaced with an MCB OD level crossing. At the bottom right of this image you'll see in the square brackets the line of route code SC003 and in the square box the engineer's line reference with the prefix and suffix numbers indicate the subdivisions and their boundaries. So next to every level crossing there would be a board with level crossing information on it. In this case the name Kings Now at Level Crossing, the Ordnance Survey Grid Reference NT210702 and then the mileage. So from Engineer's Line Reference ECA2 it's 97 metres or 1,726 yards. So this is to the westerly side of the crossing at Kings Now. And you can see there's quite a lot going on here. There's a lot of uh, infrastructure and equipment on the track and there's the barriers, lots of cables. So what does all this equipment do and what's it used for? So this is the equipment that we have and what we're going to do is going to work around this image from uh, the bottom right in a clockwise manner. So the first thing we have is the Strail level crossing system. So Strail is a manufacturer and they produce this crossing system which fits in between the tracks and allows the vehicles to pass over the tracks. There is a, a four foot deflector plate or a chain guard and this is for anything that's hanging down from the train in the buffer area and uh, if it is hanging down then it will deflect off this and not damage the crossing system. We've also got anti-trespass panels that's the sort of spiky panels that sit either side of the crossing and that's to, to discourage anybody from trespassing and stop animals walking across the track. Then in the middle in the uh, six foot we have uh, the LiDAR obstacle detection system or the complementary object detection system or the COD. Just behind that, another side of the track, you'll see there's an arrow pointing to a reflector. I'll talk about these a bit further on but that's for the radar system. We've also got the crossing phone so you can talk to the signaller. And we've also got a CCTV camera mounted on the back of one of the wigwag light boards. So I've now just turned to face in uh, an easterly direction and we're now going to look at the other side of the track and some of the other equipment. Again, moving from the bottom right, the first thing we see is a strange pod object and this is the Honeywell YD136 radar detector. We then have the LiDAR obstacle detection system. We can then see another reflector and then we have a signal but this signal is a little bit strange because it's facing the wrong way and this is because the, the junction here allows wrong line running. So at this level crossing we can see some more of these reflectors. So what's happening here is the radar is sending a radio wave beam that's interrupted by the presence of an object. So on one side of the crossing the radar beam would be emitted to a receiver on the other side and if an object interrupts its path the signal is then not received by the transceiver indicating that there's a presence of an object. So that's why it's important that these uh, reflectors are not uh, covered up or blocked in any way. So I've now just again turned to the westerly direction and I'm looking across the crossing. And what you can see now is the barriers, the overhead line electrification, all the signage including the warnings about the CCTV in operation. And you can see the yellow chevron box and importantly the stop line. So I'm now just turn to look across the rest of the crossing. 
And now you can see the rest of the Strail crossing system. You can see the barriers. Uh, you can also see the wigwag boards. On the left-hand side is one with a CCTV camera. And on the right-hand side, the little red object is a speaker. The green porta cabin type building on the left is used by those uh, operatives from Network Rail who are working in and around this area. And I think they also use this to access the track. Uh, and that was clearly obvious by the number of uh, Network Rail vehicles that were there on the day I passed by. So there's a need to put up lots of signs, and as you can see, they can become a little bit congested, but they're all clearly visible in the right place, pointing in the right direction, and inspected and maintained on a regular basis. And most importantly, you've got the level crossing information. So if you need to contact the signaller and refer to an issue, you can refer to that information. So we've just gone further along the line. We're now in a much more rural location. And this is where you're going to see uh, a user worked crossing. So I've just arrived at the cross and I've just taken a photograph from the fence. The white picket fence just uh, demarks the uh, beginning of the crossing. Now you can see the two main lines, the red line electrification, and some location boxes on the left hand side. That's the grey boxes further down the line. So I've just now turned to face a westerly direction. And here you can see the decision point with the stop, look, listen, be aware of the trains board, the, another piece of the picket fence, the overhead line electrification warning sign, and here you can see the OLE above the track. You also note that there's uh, quite a lot of vegetation surrounding this area. So this is the crossing from the approach at New Mills Road. And you can see, going by the bicycle on the right hand side, I've been on my bike. And one of the signs advises cyclists to dismount. There is a, a turnstile a picket fence here uh, that you have to then push your bike through, close the gate, then cross the crossing and then go through a similar gate at the other side. So you can see that uh, you walk into the pen area, then you open the gate and then cross the crossing and do the same on the other side. You have to watch for this type of crossing. If you are taking a bike across, it can be a little bit uh, tricky. You can sometimes get your bike stuck in the picket fence. Uh, so the trains sound their horns. So you get a, a warning of the train approaching from a distance away. And if things go a little bit adrift, you do get an audible warning, which might give you time just to get out of the way if need be. So you can see the crossing itself with the Strail crossing system. Uh, you also notice that the uh, anti-trespass system is actually just a timber structure. So here's another close-up of the, the Strail crossing system showing the uh, deflector panel at the front in the forefoot. So whilst I was standing behind the fence taking photographs, I noticed that there was what looked like the erosion pumping failure. And I can see that this was also causing a problem for the uh, anti-trespass device that was installed, in particular these timber slats. I did also note that the side of the track, there was the rubber anti-trespass panels had been delivered and looked like they were ready to be installed. A couple of days after I took this photograph, I crossed the crossing again and noticed the network rail had made good this problem. So I had a look at my old quail map and uh, I noticed there was a, a quarry siding in between Curry Hill and Kurt Newton and uh, that was for the Kames quarry. Uh, it appears to have been lifted now but there was originally a ground frame and a private siding boundary marked by a gate. 
which allowed uh, stone and other aggregates to be removed from the quarry and transported by rail. So if we move on to Kurt Newton Station, we'll see that again, my old quail map has uh, an automatic half barrier, which has now been replaced with the new system with object detection. So we're now going to move on to the Kurt Newton crossing, which is another MCB OD crossing. And here you can see an aerial photograph of the site with a yellow box showing the location of the crossing. So here we can see another aerial photograph and you can see the station house, the platforms, the position of the red wigwag lights and the barriers themselves. So you can see two images showing the equipment on the track itself. On the left hand side you can see there's a strike in and a strike out point. And this could be an axle counter where we could count the number of axles coming in, count the number of axles leaving, and if that number is equal, then we know the train has left the block. On the right hand side, you can see there's also a strike in position where there's an axle counter, but now we've got a TPWS magnet and an obstacle indicator signal. If there's a problem with the level crossing, the TPWS magnet will cause the train to apply its emergency brakes. And if we set the distance based on the line speed of the track, the distance between the TPWS magnet and the level crossing itself, if that's sufficient braking distance, then we can protect the crossing. So I'm now just going to show you some video footage of the crossing in action. So pay particular attention to the way the vehicles pass, including the trains and the cars. Look at the barriers, how they move, look at how the lights work, and look at the other lights for the pedestrians too.